We're a little bit later coming on the air simply because we were congratulating our graduates and our students today and, and had a wonderful time doing so. And uh, we have some announcements we'll wait and give at the conclusion of the service, please. Ruth chapter number one, I read these verses last week, verse number 19. So they too, talking about Naomi and Ruth, went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said when they saw her, is this Naomi? They couldn't believe how she had changed in 10 years. And she said unto them, call me not Naomi, because that means pleasant and beautiful. She said, call me Myra, because that means bitter. She said, I'm changing my name because the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Now watch verse 21. She said, I want to give a word of testimony to all you young people that want to get away from God. You'll leave full, but the Lord had brought me home again empty. Notice what she said. The Lord had brought me home. She realized that she had made her way back to where she had belonged all the time. And she called the place home. Now, when you study the 66 books of the Bible, you'll understand that there's three variations or definitions for the word home in the Bible. The first one is referring to a tent or a tabernacle or a dwelling place or where you're habitating right now. For instance, when service is over, somebody may say to you, where are you going? And you will reply to them, I'm going home. Because that's where your habitation is right now. That's the first definition of home. The second definition refers to a country or a land or a nation. Because I'm an American, this is my homeland. And as a citizen of this country, we have the privilege of experiencing certain rights that others do not and should not have the opportunity to experience until they legally make this their homeland. Am I preaching now? This is our homeland. And I don't want to get sidetracked, but I'm going to get sidetracked, I guess. Your homeland should be one specific country. You, you can't pull two countries together and say, this is my homeland. For instance, there's no such thing as African-American. Africa's not even a country, for God's sake. It's a continent. I'm not, I'm not European-American. I am a red-blooded citizen of the United States of America. This is my home country. And so when you refer to home, you're referring to your home country. The third definition of the word home is to relay back in remembrance of where you were raised. For instance, many of us that are older now with gray in our temples, we sit down and talk about how it was years ago back when we were home. And you young people better be glad that it's not in your generation like it was in our generation because the way we had to work and the way many of these people were out in the fields raising their food, milking cattle, pulling teams of horses, these bunch of pansies we have in this generation, if it ain't a honey bun and a ho-ho, they don't even know what eating is anymore. But we constantly refer back to the days and the places in which we were raised. Many of you probably remember The Wizard of Oz. I never did like the movie unless I was high. It was, <laughs> to me, it didn't make a lot of sense, but you smoke about four joints and all them midgets jump out of them flowers, man, I'd fall out on the floor every time. <laughs> see, see the kind of people I pastor? That's the loudest clap we've had all day. Let's talk about smoking pot in the Wizard of Oz. And you remember how Dorothy wasted her life and went to other places trying to find satisfaction and relief and then at the end of the story, if I remember correctly, she taps her shoes together and repeats to herself, there's no place like home. The reality is that's more than a movie. That is the truth. I'm preaching on the subject, there's no place like home. It was, it was when Naomi left home that she found out there was no other place like it. It's when Jacob left home and got the missing his mom and his family that he found out there was no place like it. 
It was when Nehemiah was led into captivity and had a desire to go back and rebuild Jerusalem that he found out there was no place like home. It was when Gomer left Hosea and wasted her life and became a prostitute and was sold for the half price of a slave that she found out there was no place like home. It was when the crazy man got delivered out of the tombs and put his clothes on and Jesus saved him and the Lord told him, go home and tell your family and friends what great things I've done for you because there's something about home. I wish every one of you young people knew what we knew as older people now. These are the best days of your life, man, and you don't even know it. These are the best days of your life. You, <laughs> I'm serious. You don't pay the water bill. You don't pay the electric bill. You don't go grocery shopping. You don't even know what a washing machine is. You think a vacuum cleaner is a Martian from another world. All you, you know, you're just like a hog. All you know how to do is eat and sleep and make a mess. Now, I'm telling you, man, we ought to rename our kids. It's the God's truth, man. Kids are pigs. I was at a youth camp some time ago, and there was a stack of underwear in the men's shower room. I mean, it was just a hurdle of underwear. And it was Friday. We'd been there all week. And I looked at one boy, and I said, are any of them your underwear? He said, no, sir. I said, how do you know? He said, because I hadn't changed since I got here. <laughs> now, that's what we're raising. <laughs> My mother would be disappointed in him. My mother always taught me, you put clean underwear on every day in case you go to the hospital. How many of you remember mama saying, you go to the hospital? Now, I don't know what that meant, but I tell you what I was raised thinking, Brother Jones, if you went to the hospital with dirty underwear, they let you die. That's the only thing I could get out of that. And so when that drunk hit my car and flipped me four and a half times down the interstate, we were in the air and I'm thinking, thank God, mama, well, they were clean before the car started rolling over. Let, let me clarify myself. There's just something about home. A preacher friend of mine that I loved like a second daddy, after pastoring one great church for 40 years, developed dementia and began to lose his thought patterns. I remember the last time my wife and I went by to see him. He had gotten so bad he didn't know who he was. He didn't know who his family was. And he had quit talking altogether. So the last time I went to see him, you got to understand, I love this guy so much. He lives in my heart every day of my life. I love him and respect him. I remember sitting next to his chair and looking at that look in his eye that he was just not there. And the last thing he ever did to me was he picked up a Bible that he couldn't read anymore, but he opened it up and began to kiss the pages of that Bible. He hadn't spoken weeks. He didn't even know his name. He didn't know he was home. He didn't know his, his, who his wife was. And sometimes he'd get so disinterested, dis, disoriented, Brother Anderson, they'd have to load him in the car and just ride him around the block where he'd calm down. And if you've never had a family member do this, then you don't know the hurt and that vacuum in your heart. Like they don't even know who they are. Before he died, he went over a month without speaking one solitary word. He got up one day, <clears throat> and he looked at his wife, and he looked at his son, and he pointed to the automobile that he wanted to get in the car. He didn't know where he lived. He didn't even know how to spell his first name. And they got in the car, and when they got in the car, he hit his son and told him where to turn. They came to a four-way stop. He hit his son and pointed to go that way. Hadn't spoken over a month. Brother Brian, they came to another red light, and he poked his son and told him to go that way. Here's a man who don't even know how to spell his name. And you know where he took him? He took him back to where he was raised, an old farmhouse out in the country. And they pulled up in the yard, and a man that had not spoke for over a month and did not even know his own name, Brother Tony, he looked at his son and said the last words he would ever say on this earth, I want my mama. And he said, Daddy, your mama's been dead a long, long time. Your mama's not in that shack. Your mama's in heaven with the Lord. And he said, my daddy looked down and went, Phew. That was the last thing he ever said till he saw Jesus. Isn't it something that even when you lose your mind and you lose all your capabilities and you don't know where you are, isn't it something that there's something about home that never leaves? 
I remember I went by and saw Miss Lisa's dad the other the last time I was allowed to go and he's got dementia real bad and you look at brother Wally miss Lisa's daddy doesn't know his name he don't even know where he's at he don't know if he's just eat he don't know if he's hungry he it's it, you just can't believe how far down brother Wally's gone but I'll go in there and I'll sit down with him and he don't know where he's at and he doesn't know anything and I'll sit down with him and I'll say brother Wally what's going on and he'll say I'm adding on to the house and he'll tell me how many two by fours he needs how many studs he needs who needs, he, who needs to lay the block work and what kind of an extension is going to come out of his house? Now, here's a man that doesn't even know his name. He doesn't know where he's at. He doesn't know his daughter that's sitting here today. He doesn't know his wife, Miss Kay. He don't know who they are. But even in a vastness of a mind that is going blank, there's something about home that he never forgets. I want to embed in the mind of all of our people. There is no place like home. There's three homes that God wants all of us to have. All of us. I want to mention them to you quickly. And remind you when you leave here, there's no place like home. Enjoy every day that you're home because one day it will never be like this again. And even when you go back after you leave, it is never the same once you leave home. So you better love and enjoy every minute of a good Christian home while you've got it. The first home God wants us to have, he wants us a home to relax in. A place to just seemingly, as we would say, let your hair down. It's a home, not a house. I heard of a neighborhood where a, a, a place, a dwelling had burnt to the ground. And there was a man and woman standing there with a couple of kids in their hand. And they were standing on the sidewalk watching their dwelling burn to absolutely nothing but ashes. And a little girl was standing there with her daddy and the mother had tears running down her face as all their heirlooms and all their furniture and all their paperwork was gone. The rooms, their bedrooms, their furniture, everything was gone. And they were standing there and one of the neighbors reached over and looked at the little girl and said, I'm sorry you lost your home tonight. And she looked over at that neighbor and said, I didn't lose my home tonight. I lost my house, but my home is standing right here with me. There's a difference in having a house and having a home. And when you have a Christian home, there are several things that God expects out of it. A Christian home is a place where there ought to be affection one to another. It's a place of warmth. Home ought to be a place of welcome. Home ought to be a place of love. Home ought to be a place where you can just sit down, unplug from the world, your job, and the day, and relax and in just enjoy the presence of your family. Home is a place where you ought to hold hands. Home is a place where you ought to kiss. Home is a place where you ought to hug. You know, you young married couples, you, you freaking amaze me. It took the shotgun and the grace of God to keep you off from fornicating till you got married. Now that you're married and God says it's all right, you act like a nun and you don't want nobody touching you and you're sanctified yourself to the Pope. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Oh, yeah. You can clap or pout. It doesn't matter. I get paid the same. And you men are the same way. Oh, you couldn't wait to spend more time with your wife. You hated to see the sun go down when you had to leave and go home. Now you do everything you can not to be around your wife. And you wonder why there's no love and there's no affection in the home. All the children here is a bunch of arguing, fussing, fighting, complaining, division, strife, malice. I'm going to tell you men something. I know from an education, when you walk in a house and your wife is doing the dishes and you say to her, how are you doing, baby? And she answers one word, fine. She ain't fine. She ain't fine. Women don't answer with one word. That is your last chance to get out of there before she throws a skillet and splits your head wide open. And for, <laughs> and for you that don't know, don't you ever turn your back to her. Don't give her a free shot. You walk out backwards and go to the closest florist you can find and buy some flowers. If you can't afford them, stop at the cemetery. They'll never miss them anyhow. Pick you up a bouquet. But God wants our home to be a home of affection. 
God wants our home to be a home of appreciation. Letting each other know and letting them understand the sacrifice that all of us have to make to make a home click. Do you understand a home, it doesn't develop on its own. It takes an effort of everybody cooperating and appreciating the different avenues that a home has to be fulfilled. For instance, my wife has never washed a car. She's never vacuumed a car. She doesn't put gas in her car unless I'm not there. She doesn't do stuff like that. Why are you men looking at me like that? <laughs> y'all got a virus over here in the amen corner? It's the quietest y'all been in a long, long time over here. You just take care of your wife. You do certain stuff. You keep her in a clean car. You keep the tires shiny. You keep gas in the car. You keep everything ready. I take care of all that, man. My wife don't have to come up to me and say, take the garbage out. If the garbage is full, look at me, teenagers, that means you take it out. You don't start a pyramid leaning it up against the wall. You say, well, I take it out every day. Stop it. Much, and you won't have to empty the garbage every day. Everybody's got to work together. Everybody's got to do something. My wife, I, all the menly things of the house, I don't let her change bulbs and do stuff like that. But then she's got her avenues, cleaning the house and dishes and fooling with shrubbery. Any man that wants to kiss tulips and hug bushes, you need a hormone shot. There's something wrong with you. That's a woman thing. Leave that stuff alone. I hate shrubbery. God hates shrubbery. You ought to pull that junk out, concrete it. If you want flowers, bless God, buy plastic ones. They never wilt, and you never have to water them. She can have all she wants, but she's fooling with that nonsense. I pulled 15 shrubs out of my yard this week. 15. Don't cry. She's still got 109. When is the last time you've showed appreciation in your home? Appreciation to your parents, your mate, your children. I remember one time I went somewhere and a guy walked out and he slipped a $100 bill in my pocket. Brother Dan, you're listening, aren't you? You better because your party's over too. <laughs> and he slipped a $100 bill in my pocket. And I got to thinking, you know, every time I go to a restaurant, we tip the waitress. And if you don't, please don't leave a track that you're from our church. You ought to take care of the waitress when they wait on you. That's what they live on is the tips. So I've always tipped the waitress. And I got to thinking, Brother Doug, I had the $100 bill in my pocket. And I thought, you know, out of all the years my wife has cooked for me, I've never given her a tip. There's never been a meal she cooked for me. Never, I said, that I didn't thank her. Never has my wife cooked a meal for me that I didn't say thank you. I've never taken her out, ever, that she didn't say thank you. So I decided that day, Brother Gray, I was going to give her a tip. So I got done eating, and I slid that $100 bill under the plate. She picked that plate up and said, well, dear Lord, what's that? I said, honey, it's just a tip. I wanted to tell you I love you, and I appreciate it. I should have never done that. Because <laughs> for the next three months, halfway through my meal, she'd pick my plate up <laughs> to see if there was anything under it. <laughs> what's wrong with showing a little appreciation? I know there's not a lot of shouting, but I'm going to preach anyhow. What, what, what's wrong with showing a little affection? That's what built your marriage. That made you one of the things that made you wanted to be with each other. Anyhow, take time, sit down, turn the television off, light a candle, hold hands, put the kids to bed, put NyQuil in their bottle, get them drunk, knock them out, put them all in bed, let them snort crack, do whatever they got to do. Sit down, man, light a candle, hold hands, enjoy being married and just being together. Make time for each other. You got to have time for affection. You got to have time for appreciation. You got to have time to show each other attention. You got to set stuff aside. Side and you don't ever find time for your mate. It doesn't happen. There will always be something. You have to make time for your mate. You got to set. You have to set a schedule. Honest to God, my wife and I have to say, okay, we're meeting at three o'clock. That's how. Am I right, Miss Kid? That's how packed my schedule is. We have to set appointments to meet, but but we set them, and we meet. And most men don't want to spend time with their wives. And, and if you went home tomorrow with a, back, a bucket of flowers, and she opened the door, and you said, Honey, I love you! You know what she'd do? She'd call me and say, Preacher, he's drunk again. He's back on the bottle. It's like one lady, she was laying in bed one night, and she felt her husband reach over and rub her neck. She said, Wow. 
He hadn't done that in a long time. Then he took his hand and he rubbed down her arm. She said, what? This is, I hadn't done that since we dated. And then he touched her hip and she said, great day in the morning. And right about the time she was starting to think, he quit. She said, what are you doing? He said, I found the remote. I don't have to touch it anymore. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to get through this or not, but... Most homes are literally hell on earth. Mistrust, anger, dissatisfaction, criticism, hateful, unhappy. Your mate, you got to learn to be content. You got to learn you're two people that came from two different worlds with two different personalities and two different raisins. And there's going to be times when you don't agree on stuff. But, but you got to come together and find out you can talk it out and talk through it and try to find some positive ground where you guys can say at the end of the conversation, we've gained something here. We've learned something both about each other. One out of every two marriages in church people wind up in divorce. And I know some of it you can't help, and I'm sorry that it happened. But I want our young people, I'm trying to teach our young people, so you that have experienced the pain and the heartache of people not being true to you and unfaithful to you, you ought to be the first one shouting me on when I preach on this because God forbid Forbid we don't want our children to go through some of the things that we had to go through to find out what makes your marriage work. You got to have a home to relax in. Number two, God wants you to have a home uh, to rejoice in. And that's why we have a local church here. That's why God instituted a local church. It's a place where you can come and share one another's burdens. The Bible says that we are to bear one another's burdens. Did you know I've had people call me in this church that literally felt like their life was falling apart? They called me on the phone. I listened to their story, never said a word. And then they said to me at the end of the conversation, man, I feel so much better now. You helped me, brother kid. Thank God you're my pastor. I didn't said a word. They weren't looking for somebody with all the answers. They were just looking for somebody that cared enough that would learn to shut up and be a good listener and not interrupt and let them pour their heart out. And that's what church people ought to be for. We ought to be able to come together and share our burdens and bear one another's burdens. And if you're a real Christian, you don't go home and put it on Facebook and start running your mouth and cutting people down. We shout here, we put it on TV, we shout at Emmaus of Kingsport. We don't edit it out. We don't do like a lot of preachers and take that out because they're afraid they're going to offend somebody in the living room. I got news, that crowd in your living room ain't coming anyhow. And when I come to this church, I've come for one reason, to give God the glory for all the goodness of God that's going on in my life. I've got a right to stand up and say, blessed be name of the Lord. Now, I doubt if I'm going to finish my message, I'll just quit. I was in jail one summer, and the judge went to my daddy and said, look, I want to get your son out of jail. He's crazy. I don't want him to spend another summer in jail. Have you got somewhere you could put him? He said, yeah, I'm going to ship him down to Mississippi and let him haul pup wood all summer. Now, I'm 15 years old. I weighed 102 pounds. Just got out of a dry clinic. I weighed 102 pounds. And so my dad said, we're shipping you to Mississippi. You're going to haul pup wood. Well, I, I didn't know what pup wood was. I thought, shoot, he might drive a truck. So I get down there, and I'm at Uncle Sherman's house. And you understand? I don't know what pup wood is. I had never been out of the city. I thought poison ivy was pot the first time I saw it. <laughs> Thank God I didn't try to smoke it, but I thought, man, if I could get my hands on that stuff. So Uncle Sherman said, I'll get you up in the morning. We're going to start hauling pup wood. I said, all right, ain't got no problem. Morning. Morning, my foot. Four o'clock, he grabbed my feet and yanked me out in the middle of the floor and said, get up, half the day's gone. So I got up and I went in the kitchen. I didn't even know God was up at four o'clock in the morning. I staggered in the kitchen and my aunt said, what do you want for breakfast? I said, Fruit Loops. You don't haul pup wood eating Fruit Loops. Let me tell you that right now, brother. Uncle Sherman ate what they called cat head biscuits. How many of you remember that name? Well, I wouldn't eat them because they said cat head. It, I just felt like I had hair in my mouth every time I bit into it. So I could not eat a cat head biscuit. So I eat a bowl of Fruit Loops. 
That sucker took me outside. I weighed 102. He handed me a chainsaw that weighed 95. Took me out in the woods with two horses that looked like they'd been through the Civil War. I didn't know a pine tree from an oak tree. I didn't know them from an evergreen. I was raised in the city. If it had a trunk on it, I cut it. Yeah, son, you talking about clearing the ground? I know how to clear the ground. So I cut bushes, shrubbery, roses. Yeah, I went all across that property. And he had two horses, bless his heart. I felt so sorry for them. They looked like they was ready to die any minute. And he'd cut down a load of them log trees, and he'd back that horse up and put what he called tongs around them trees. And them horses, he could talk to them, and they had turn signals on them. That horse would start to pull, and he'd say, gee, and that sucker turned left. Had turn signals on his horse. He'd say, haw, and that thing would turn right. He'd say, whoa, and that thing would stop. But that's the most pitiful looking things I'd ever seen. Swayed back. Had scratches down both their sides. One of them was cross-eyed. That thing was so cross-eyed. If it would have cried, tears would have run down its back. i never seen a horse so cross-eyed in my life. And Uncle Sherman and Brother Boyle hooked, them dog, uh, hooked that horse up to them logs, and he, he went, get it, boy. And son, when he did, the back of that horse straightened out. The nostrils turned inside out. His lips went up. His ears stood up. He got to stomp on that ground. And son, that little old mangy-looking thing drug that whole stack of logs to the top of the hill where the truck was. I learned something. Pressure brings out the best in you. So we took it home, and I told Uncle Sherman on the way home, I said, you killed them horses. They'll be dead in the morning. They'll be laying in the field with all four hooves straight up in the air. I said, you've worked their brains out. First time I've ever seen a horse sweat till it was white, like lather coming off of it. I'd never seen that before. And so we took them in there, and let me tell you how crazy that horse was. We let it out of that trailer, and that stupid horse took out across that field, jumping that high, wagging its head up in the air. I said, see, Uncle Sherman, you sweated the brains out of that horse. I said, that horse has lost his mind. He's having a seizure going out across that field. He said, no, he's not. He said, he knows he's been pulling against the world all day, but he's at the owner's house now. He knows I'm putting food in the crib. He knows I'm putting water in the bucket. Even though he's had a bad day. <laughs> That horse knows he's had a bad day. He knows it's going to be a bad day tomorrow. But he knows when I pull that bridle off, he's where he belongs at home. I'll tell you why he's a jumping. He's about to get watered. He's about to get fed. He ain't worrying about tomorrow. He's just rejoicing in the fact that the load has been lifted and he's about to be fed. Oh, let me preach to you a little while now. Hallelujah to God. When I come to church, I may have had a bad day before, and I may have a bad day tomorrow, but while I'm in the house of God, I'm going to get fed and let God give me liberty to worship. Number three, and I'm done. God wants us to have a home of rest. I'm referring to an eternal home. God has a place for you prepared. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Every house you experience on earth is nothing compared to the glamour and the glory of the place that God has prepared for his children. I notice, you know, it's... I don't have time to preach it. I'm out of time and gas. I'm about wore out. But I love to watch you people get nervous when we shout. I love to see you squirm. I love it. I could tell you're uncomfortable with it. And every time I see you squirm like that, when somebody stands up or shouts or runs, you know what I pray? I hope your mansion's next door to mine when we get to glory. I hope you're right next door to me. And every once in a while, I'm just going to open the window and say, Glory! Let's stand with our heads bowed. Let's give the Lord a hand. You're glad to be in the house of God today. Thank you for being here today. These are the days of Elijah Declaring the word of the Lord And these are the days of your servant Moses' righteousness being the
the storm.